in the infamous movie Talladega Nights, theologian and race car driver Ricky Bobby sits down with his family at the dinner table to eat a bountiful feast of fast food. And as he's sitting there, he begins to pray over the meal and he begins like this, dear tiny baby Jesus, eight pounds, six ounce, with your golden fleece diapers. And in the midst of his prayer, his father-in-law has had enough. It says, he was a man. He had a beard. And then Cal, Ricky's close friend, chimes in and says, when I think of Jesus, I like to think of him with a tuxedo t-shirt on, which means I can be formal, but I also like to party. And then Cal says something very revealing. He says, because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party too. What's the problem with their view of Jesus? They have shaped and formed their image of Christ after themselves, their own desires, their own wants, instead of who he truly is. If we don't intentionally shape our views of Jesus around truth, we will unintentionally shape our view of Jesus around lies. I know that's a mouthful, so I'm going to say it again. If we don't intentionally shape our view of Jesus around truth, we will unintentionally shape our view of Jesus around lies. And we are just as prone as Ricky, Bobby, and Cal. Now, I'm not condoning that movie. I'm not encouraging anybody to go watch it, but I think it bears a great illustration of the human desire to shape God in our image instead of aligning what we believe about God with truth. So what do you believe about Jesus? What is it that if you were really graciously curious and honest with yourself in your heart of hearts, not the answers you think you need to answer, not what you think you need to say, not what the church answer is, but what do you really truly believe about Jesus? And does that show up in your life? Today, we're going to continue our series in the book of Mark. And last week, we saw the disciples wrestling with this very question. Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And there's lots of opinions. Some say Elijah, others John the Baptist, others one of the prophets. And then he gets to the heart of the matter. But who do you say I am? And Peter, in an awesome moment, says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Savior who's come into the world. And Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You did not get there on your own smarts, Peter. This was a heavenly revelation. And Peter gets this moment right. He's the Christ. But their expectation of who Jesus was and what the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior would come and do was vastly different from what Jesus actually came to do. You see, the disciples and many Jewish minds of that day believed that the the Messiah's coming would be uh, a season where Israel would hold victory over their oppressors, which are the Romans. And so they thought when the Messiah came, he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and inaugurate a heavenly kingdom then and there. This was Jewish nationalism. And so they had these expectations. And then after, after he, Jesus and Peter have this interchange, Jesus tells them exactly what the Messiah, what the Savior, what the Christ, what he came to do and is all about. And he says he's going to not overthrow Rome, but he will in fact suffer and die by their hand. And beyond that, he says, and I'm calling you, Peter, and James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, I'm calling you guys to come after me, to pick up your cross, which was the Roman torture device used for execution, and follow me. Follow me in my sufferings. This would have shattered their view of the Messiah. Everything they had been taught from the moment they were born, everything that they believed, what their families taught them, what education taught them is the Messiah is going to come and throw off our oppressors. And Jesus says, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to suffer and die and resurrect. And this would have been a, a moment of shattering, not just because it's, it changes their perspective of what the Messiah came for, but also think about this. These guys were with Jesus day in and day out. He is their rabbi and friend. And when they hear he's going to die, what does that do in their hearts? Like we see it in Peter. Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, no, far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus rebukes him in this famous rebuke, get behind me, Satan. Because the words Peter spoke there of a satanic origin. 
you don't have in mind the things of God. The Messiah did not come to triumph and be a conquering warrior king or a military political leader. He's come as a suffering servant to serve even to the point of death on a cross. And immediately following that, in that picture, that whole scene plays out in a place called Caesarea Philippi, which was a very paganly influenced area at the gates of hell, which was a pagan worship site where depraved and disgusting acts were performed in the, names of, in the name of false gods. Jesus has them climb up a mountain with him. Peter, James, and John. We're going to start in verse 2 of chapter 9. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high, a high mountain by themselves. So we know from the other accounts in Matthew and Luke, and you can look those up uh, on your own, but we won't be looking at those in particular today, but they do inform this story as well. It gives a little bit more context. In Matthew and Luke, we know that they're going up the mountain to pray. This is Mount Hermon. And if you are familiar with any of your your Bible study history, um, this is also Mount Sinai. This is the mountain where God met with Moses and his people and made a covenant and gave them commandments. And so this is a big figurative story, but they're climbing up Mount Hermon, the same mountain Moses climbed up and met the Lord. And uh, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him. And many scholars and commentators assume that Peter, James, and John were probably Jesus' kind of inner circle. They were there at the Garden of Gethsemane. They're there in this moment. They're there for kind of some in inner circle moments, but I read a really fun commentary um, that, that says there's another reason why <laughs> Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And the commentator said his name's David Guzik. He said, really, I think Jesus took Peter, James, and John up the mountain because he knew if he left them alone at the base of the mountain, they would have caused a ruckus because there's the, the sons of thunder and then Peter who puts his foot in his mouth all the time. And if I would have left them alone, there could be some real problems with the religious leaders who were starting to be very antagonistic with Jesus. And so Jesus takes them up the mountain, kind of babysitting them on his prayer retreat. So he leads them up this high mountain, 9,232 feet high, Mount Hermon. And when I always thought of this story, I thought of arid, dry, hot, dusty mountain. You're climbing, just exhausted. But this mountain, the climb has got to be strenuous, but it actually has year-round snow. Most years, all year round, Mount Hermon has snow on it. And so imagine you're with Jesus in your tunic, robe, and sandals, most likely, climbing through the snow. Like, how exhausting is that trip, right? So they get up there, and then Mark just delves straight in, just dives straight in to the meat of the story. Look at verse 3, or the second part of verse 2 here. And he, he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Like he just jumps in. And we know from the other accounts of this that Peter, James, and John were, it says their eyes were heavy with sleep. They're exhausted from the trek up and they're, they're about to fall asleep. They're in that like dreamy space between wake and sleep where you're kind of here, but you're really kind of not. And so they're ready to fall asleep and Jesus is transfigured. And it's almost like it kind of wakes them out of their stupor and they see him transfigured. The word here in the original language for transfigured is metamorpho which is the word where we get our word metamorphosis, of course. That's a transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And the, the context of transfigured or transfiguration, metamorpho, is not, it, it is that whatever is within, truly within Jesus, is now being revealed without. And when it says here that there was this, uh, his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And, and in other accounts, it says that his face was shining like the sun. It's not as though God turned on the heavenly spotlights or this was golden hour. This is the radiant glory of Jesus being revealed. That glory that was within being revealed without. Metamorpho. So Jesus is transfigured. And I love that they're trying the best they can with human language to describe a heavenly moment. They're like, it's like somebody bleached his clothes. Unreal. Like they've seen Jesus in the grit and the grime. They just saw him climb a mountain with blisters on his feet and sweat on his brow, dirt on his face, grit under his fingernails. And now they see his appearance transformed into this glorious moment of radiance and glory and majesty where his face and clothing are shining. And when I read the language, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them, it almost makes me think, like, I need a pair of sunglasses to look at Jesus. Like, my eyes would be squinting to try and see him. But this isn't even the, the climax of the story yet. It gets better. 
And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So here's two heavyweights of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. They just appear there with Jesus. And we don't know how the disciples knew who they were. They just do. And Moses was kind of the embodiment of the law, while Elijah was thought in Jewish mindset as kind of the preeminent prophet. And so here, standing before Peter, James, and John is the embodiment of the law and the prophets and the very word of God himself. This is a moment in the Jewish mind where this, the, the totality of the word of God is present before them. And they were talking with Jesus. And we know that from the other accounts, they're actually talking about Jesus' departure from the earth. And the word in, that, in, in, in those other accounts for departure is exodus. It doesn't just mean when Jesus exits the earth. It literally means when he dies. They're talking about his plan of redemption that is coming to fulfillment within a year's time. And so they're discussing this and Peter chimes in. Of course, Peter chimes in, right? And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. When I first heard that, I'm like, what the audacity of Peter, right? You're seeing glory and you're like, and this is how I always interpret it. Jesus, man, you're lucky that I'm here. I'm going to make sure everybody knows about this. I'll be your PR guy. Like you are so lucky that my presence is here. That's not what he's saying. He says, Rabbi, it is good that we're here. Now listen to the next part. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. That's a weird, uh, that's a weird offer, right? Like they're up there on the mountain. There's this glorious, beautiful moment. And Peter's like, let's go camping. I got the s'mores. We'll make a fire. I'll set up some tents. But when he talks about tents, he's not talking about camping. He's talking about tabernacling. He wanted to set up shelters so that Jesus, Moses, Elijah, and he himself and James and John could be this way forever. Remember, he just heard hard teaching from Jesus down at the base of the mountain in front of the gates of hell. He heard that Jesus is going to suffer and die. And he heard that himself and the other disciples are to follow in his example. And now he has this moment of transfigured glory. And he's saying, his heart's crying out, God, I I don't want what we talked about at the base of the mountain. I want this. Let's keep it this way, Jesus. And he says, "I'll, I'll set up tents. I'll set up tabernacles. We can stay together. And look at this last verse, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. There's something really interesting in this passage that Peter really longs for this to stay this way. He longs to be in the presence of the glory of God. And that is something that is a universal human desire. We all desire glory. He wants it to stay this way. Let's set up shelters and stay here, Jesus. Forgo the plan of the cross and sufferings. Let's stay in glory. We are all drawn to glory. It's the reason why stories of unconditional love draw us to tears. It's the reason why God's creation, a glimpse of his glory in what he's created, brings us to to awe and wonder. It's the reason why when you're on the beach and the sun is setting, the world just stops to watch that golden ball of fire dip beneath the waves. This is the human experience. We all desire glory. And here Peter is saying, I want it to be this way forever. And he's also a little bit terrified. And a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, actually, um, at, as the beginning of this series, we talked about um, this in the teaching team. And Heather Jones was kind of, she had a great thought on this, that Jesus is a space, is a person that you know you are safe and loved and secure. And when you're in his presence, it's a little terrifying because he is holy, righteous, almighty, sovereign God. And so we see that here, right? It says they're terrified and yet they want it to be this way. There's this mingling feeling of fear and awe and wonder and dread and, and, and love and worship and adoration all mixed together in this moment. And a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. So a cloud comes down and overshadows them. Overshadow is the same word that's used in other places in the New Testament to indicate a powerful presence of God. It's the word that's used when uh, it says that the power of the Most High will overshadow Mary and in the virgin conception. 
And so this is a word that's used of powerful God presence. And in the Jewish mind, a descending cloud was an indicator of the Messiah coming. They thought he's coming on the clouds in power and glory. And so as soon as they see this cloud descend, they know this is an indication. Jesus is the Messiah. James and John must have been like, Peter, you were actually right, man. Awesome. Good job. This is the Messiah. And so it's this cloud of God's glory. It was the cloud that led them out of Egypt. It's the cloud that was in the tabernacle and in the temple. And now it's on the mountain. And here they are in the midst of the cloud. And out of the cloud, a voice comes. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. This is the father's adoration for his child. He loves Jesus. But this is far more than that. This is also confirmation to Jesus that on his march towards the cross in the last year of his ministry, that that he is on the way to the cross and the Father is well pleased with him. In the other accounts of the same story in Matthew and Luke, you you see that uh, they expound on God's statement here. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so the Father is confirming to Jesus and before the disciples that this is his son. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Can you imagine, like, can you just imagine this moment? They just saw the glory, they heard the voice, they saw the cloud, they saw Moses and Elijah, this whole crazy thing unfolds. And then the way Mark writes it is it's like, gone, gone. Can you imagine... (laughs) eyes wide like plates and jaws drop to the ground as they look at Jesus. And now he's not transfigured and he looks like how they're used to him looking. But I don't think they ever looked at him the same again because they've experienced his glory. Verse eight, and suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but only, but Jesus only. And they said, as they were coming down the mountain, He charged them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Jesus knows that if word gets out about what just happened, the Jewish mindset still has a distorted view of what the Messiah came to do. And they would try to shove him into some sort of military or political leadership. (coughs) Excuse me. So he he says, don't tell anybody until the Son of Man, which is one of his messianic titles from the book of Daniel, uh, rises until he's risen from the dead. Verse 10, so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean, even though Jesus has clearly laid out his death, burial, and resurrection, his sufferings. He's laid it all out for them bare. They're still struggling to understand and catch on and grasp on to the reality that lies ahead of them. So they're questioning what this might mean. And as they're walking down the mountain, they have 9,232 feet of, of elevation to kind of ponder what just happened on the mountaintop. Like, and they're processing. And you can see it. They begin to ask him theological questions. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Now, they're clear that Jesus is the Messiah. They saw the Shekinah glory cloud come down. They saw the Father confirm that Jesus is his son. They, they know that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. But they also know that there's prophecy and the scribes speak to this, that Elijah is to come first. (coughs) That Elijah is to come before Jesus, kind of the forerunner to restore things. And this is a prophecy from the book of Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So they would have been familiar with this and they would have said, Look, Jesus, we get it. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. Where's Elijah? Like, did we miss him? Is this just adventures and missing the point again? Or <clears throat> what's going on? How did, how did we not see Elijah? And Jesus answers their question. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. So he says, look, Elijah did come. And they did to him whatever they pleased. And later on, the disciples realized, oh, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. I believe that's from John chapter one. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so he was the forerunner paving the way for Jesus to come and and minister. But in the midst of his answer to the question, look at what he says here. 
And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? As they descend the Mount of Transfiguration, he points them to another mount, the Mount of Calvary. He points them to the, one, the mountain that he's been trying to point them to over and over and over again, the Mount of his suffering. The Mount that they're struggling to believe is going to happen. Where on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's clothed, he's clothed in, in radiant, glorious light. On the Mount of Calvary, he's stripped naked. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's side by side with Moses and Elijah. On the Mount of Calvary, he's side by side by, with common criminals. We're on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's worshiped in fear and trembling. On the Mount of Calvary, he's mocked. Jesus is again pointing them to the reason he's come to suffer and be treated with contempt, ultimately to die and resurrect. And so I just want to come back and pull out two things from this passage that I think are really important for us as we question for ourselves, who is Jesus? And the first one, Jesus is God. Now, this, this is a kind of the heart of our faith. It's, it's a very core, essential belief for, for Christians. Jesus is God. But I hope because it's so essential and so oft told, it doesn't become some trite reality in our heart. This should blow our minds. That God himself, the ancient of days, came down in human likeness, that he was fully God and fully man, that Jesus took humanity onto his divinity and he lived in the grit and grime of the world that you and I live in. This should never become some trite theological reality. It should be a beautiful picture of our God always. And so as we think through this, I want you to wrestle with, is Jesus God to you? Look at it again here in the, in the passage says he was transfigured before them. This is where Jesus unveils his glory, that the, the, the glory that has been within all along is now revealed without. Frederick Dale Bruner says it this way, what Jesus was within once was made visible without. It, it's not that, that the light just shined perfectly on Jesus, it's that his glory radiated. And I, I read many commentators um, and scholars kind of view of this moment And a lot of them say the transfiguration is a miracle. And I understand because it's pretty astonishing. But there was one commentator and I really liked what he had to say. He said, it's not a miracle. It's actually the ceasing of an ongoing miracle. The real miracle is that Jesus could ever veil his glory in the first place. The very God of very God, the ancient of days, Yahweh came down and veiled his glory for 30 years. And we see a glimpse behind that in this story. What Jesus once was with, or was within was once made visible without. And they're trying so hard with human language to describe this moment. His, his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. And if this wasn't enough, for the disciples to believe that Jesus is God, if his miracles and his teaching with authority and power, if his own claims to be God, if his transfiguration was not enough for them, God the Father himself claims that Jesus is God. Look at it. This is my beloved son. God the Father himself claims that Jesus is God. And he's kind of authoritative on who God is, right? And he, he says, this is my son. Now, this is clearly an affirmation of relationship and adoration, but it is more than that. It is also an affirmation that Jesus is the son of God, God the son. He's the second person in the Trinity. He says, Jesus is my beloved son. He is God. This would not have been lost on Peter, James, and John as they're standing there on the mountain. So who is Jesus to you? Have you begun to shape and form your view of Jesus around lies or your own desires? Again, if we don't intentionally shape our view of Jesus around the truth, we will unintentionally shape our view of Jesus around lies. It will happen. Even if unintentional, it will happen. So what do you believe about Jesus? Here the father says, this is his son. Is Jesus God to you? 
Is he the son of God or is he just a good teacher, a, a moral person, a philosopher, a lunatic? What is your view of Jesus? Here's why this is so important. Because your view of Jesus, my view of Jesus, impacts everything about us. It impacts our marriages, our parenting, how we engage with our parents, how we engage in school or the workplace. It impacts how we view ourselves, others, and God himself. Our view of Jesus permeates every aspect of our life. This is a crucial and pivotal question. And we can often kind of Jesus juke ourselves because we know the Sunday school answer. Is Jesus God? Yeah, he's God, right? I mean, it's pretty clear in this passage, he's God. But if we believe that, does it really show up in our life? If you believe Jesus is God, do you obey him? If you believe Jesus is a good shepherd, are you experiencing his friendship and proximity and closeness? What we believe is revealed by our behaviors. Your beliefs are revealed by your behaviors. So if you were to examine your life with gracious curiosity, not, not condemnation and, and self-judgment, but with gracious curiosity, do you live as though Jesus is God? It's a hard question, but if you can hold a self-evaluative mirror up to yourself before the Lord and just say, God, reveal to me areas I, I, I don't, my, my belief about you doesn't accord with what the truth says and help me to repent of those and trust in you. And so Jesus clearly reveals himself to be God. His transfigured glory is on display for the disciples to see in that moment and for us to see today in this passage. And think of what this moment meant to the disciples. Think of the power of this moment. They just heard very hard teaching that their friend's going to die, their rabbi's going to die, that he's going to suffer, and that they are going to follow in his footsteps in the future. And then he takes them up a high mountain, Peter, James, and John, and shows them his glory because he knew in order for them to endure the suffering, suffering and the difficulties that lay ahead, they needed a sight adjustment. They needed to see Jesus for who he truly is. Our ability to endure suffering is directly connected to our view of God. Our ability to endure suffering is directly connected to our view of God. And here Jesus says, this is who I truly am, unveiled glory and majesty. I am the ancient of days. I am Yahweh. I am very God of very God, as our brothers wrote in the Nicene Creed. And Jesus reveals this to them, knowing that this would be a marker moment for them as they move forward in leadership in the church, experiencing persecution and suffering. And it was a marker moment. Both Peter and John write about this later on in their own writings. John writes about it in John chapter 1, and Peter writes about it in 2 Peter, remembering this moment when they saw Jesus' glory. Our ability to endure suffering is directly connected to our view of God. And here's the cool thing with Jesus. Jesus is simultaneously the good shepherd who is a close, comforting, nurturing friend and the almighty sovereign God. He's both at all times, which means in the midst of suffering, if we can hold those high views of Jesus, that we have a close friend who loves us and is there with us when it hurts. And we have an almighty, powerful God who will sustain us when it hurts. And he's doing that, giving the disciples a picture of who he is for their future sufferings and, and persecutions, that they might remember the glory of Jesus even in the midst of that. Your ability to endure suffering is directly tied to your view of Jesus. One of the things I love about this passage too is we don't have to work very hard to discover the application. In fact, God the Father kind of gives it to him, give it to, gives it to us himself. And it's very simple. Listen to him. If, if Jesus is God, you should probably listen to him. Kind of a simple idea. If, if we believe this about Jesus, our life should look like this. If you believe he's God, the behavior is listen. Look at it again in the passage. He says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now the word there in the original language for listen is akuo. Kind of fun to say akuo. And it's where we get our English word acoustic. But it has far more to do with just hearing auditory noise. It is 
As a context in the original language, akuo means to listen with the intent to understand and obey. Listen, understand, obey. Akuo. And so here he's telling the disciples, look, I know you just heard hard teaching at the base of this mountain. I know difficulties are coming ahead. But the father here says, this is my son. Akuo him. Hear him. Listen to him. Because things are going to get difficult ahead. And regardless of what comes, listen to him to understand and obey. And that was the immediate context for them. They're, they're to listen to Jesus despite what comes. And what does this mean for us? And I think of uh, listening in kind of two different veins. Firstly, listening to the teaching of the word of God. Coming under scripture in humility and surrender to be formed and shaped by it in awe and wonder to obey the commands in the scripture in the New Testament. There are commands that are upon us from the apostles and from Jesus himself of how we ought to live in light of, listen, this is important, in light of the love and grace and mercy and acceptance and forgiveness and favor you've been lavished with. Now you're supposed to give that stuff away like confetti, just throw it everywhere. Love everybody. Forgive all offenses. This is the commands of the New Testament. So part of listening is surrendering and submitting to the word of God as the authority in our lives. But there's another part, and this is kind of a new journey for me. I, there's lots of different terms for it, contemplative prayer, but I, I call it listening prayer. <clears throat> and I started this about two years ago, and it's where you are sitting down to hear from God. And, and it, it, this is so countercultural. It's so counter to how our culture works and how we function. We're go, 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 go. Noise in the car, noise at home, noise until bedtime. Even then, even then we got the fans going, right? But this type of listening b- prayer is so countercultural. It's going to require that you and I carve out time and be intentional with it. And so I wanted to just give some practical tools from Jesus' life, but also from my own experience on how do we do listening prayer? How do we sit in the presence of God and just listen to him? Firstly, it requires silence and solitude. Silence in that you knock out all the voices. Solitude in that you get away from the masses. You're probably not going to hear from God with a toddler on your anchor ankle, a podcast in your ears, and dinner on the stove. It's probably not going to happen. God can do whatever he wants. But it's probably not the best condition to, to sit yourself in a posture of listening to God. So you need silence and solitude. What if our communities, our life groups, our families, and our discipleship groups became places where we supported each other to do this? Because this is hard in the very busy and noisy world we live in. But what if you could call somebody in a life group and say, hey, I I need 20 minutes of just silence and solitude with Jesus. Can you take the kids? What if we did that in community together? So it requires silence and solitude. Second thing is benevolent detachment. And that's not my phrase. This is taken from many other sources. One of them is John Eldridge, who has the one minute pause app. If you've used that, you're probably familiar with this idea. But benevolent detachment is entrusting everything and everyone to Jesus. And when I do this in my listening prayer, I just sit there and these are the words I say, Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. And and last uh, two nights ago, actually, I was sitting there out back. I got this little prayer seat and uh, I was listening to God and worries and cares and anxieties start coming in. And I just had to continually say, God, I trust you with my wife. God, I trust you with my kids schooling stuff. God, I trust you in this situation. Every time it comes in, God, I trust you, benevolent detachment and giving it over and away to him. Because often our minds and hearts are like spiritual junk drawers and we carry people and problems and worries and anxieties and cares. And some of that's good things to carry in your heart. But in order to hear God, you've got to release all that to Jesus and listen. And then the last thing is perseverance. Look, when I started this over two years ago, I hated it. (laughs) Sitting there for 15 minutes in silence, listening to God. Like it was not fun for me. And it felt like this is not productive. I got nothing out of that. I heard nothing. But this isn't just about hearing. This is about literally sitting in the presence of God. And so persevere. Don't give up. I promise you that if you persevere in this, it will eventually be life-giving. I promise that. 
And how can I promise that? Because I know the one that you're sitting down with. And when you sit down in the presence of Jesus, it will be life-giving because you're sitting down with the giver of life. And so if you struggle with it and you think it's lame or it's difficult or I don't want to, just don't give up. Persevere in it. Give it a try. Because our lives are so busy, so noisy, we have to begin to reorient our lives intentionally around the rhythms of Jesus, around Jesus as the center of our life. Ruth Haley Barton has this to say on the subject. As I'm reading her book, Invitation to Solitude, she says, many of us try to shove spiritual transformation into the nooks and crannies of a life that's already unmanageable rather than being willing to arrange our life for what our heart most wants. We think that somehow we will fall into transformation by accident. We have to be intentional. This cannot happen if we just shove listening prayer and the practices of Jesus into the nooks and crannies of an unmanageable, anxiety-ridden, busy life. We have to begin to shape and form our life around the practices of Jesus. And he did this very thing. We see him over and again going up on a mountain in silence and solitude to pray. So who is Jesus to you? What do you believe about the Son of God? And as a result of that, are you listening to him? I'm going to release to the campuses. Thank you so much for joining us. Love you guys. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I just want to challenge us with two questions as we evaluate what we've discussed today. Uh, Firstly is, do you live as though Jesus is God? Again, coming back to that question, who is Jesus to you? And if you believe he's God, does that actually show up in your life? Do you live as though he's God? The second one is I want to challenge us to practice listening prayer every day this week for at least five minutes. As we're doing corporate prayer together in, uh, uh, the, over the month of August, just make this a part of your prayer rhythm. Spend five minutes every day in silence and solitude, benevolent detachment before the Lord, persevering in silent prayer. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much that you love us enough to send your son. And thank you for your word, which is a compass of truth and a sea of falsehood. I pray, God, for our hearts as we've heard truth today, that we would wrestle well with it and that we would not live in shame, but we would turn to your gracious love and mercy in the places that we need it most. And Father, thank you for this moment where we saw Jesus' glory. We look forward to that in the future. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.